Greetings. Welcome to Truth Seekers. Hope you've had a good week since we were last together and a good start and a good first week of 2021. How are your New Year resolutions, if you made any? How are they going? Well, if they're like mine, they've already taken a few hits. But the one that I'm most intentional about is the one of reading God's Word, the Word of God, this Holy Bible, through in its entirety this year. I've done that for a number of years now, and it has had an unbelievable impact upon my life, um, bringing me purpose and peace, and um, I could just go on and on about it. But this year, the daily Bible that uh, I'm reading through, I'll be giving to my granddaughter, Haven, and it, it'll be well-worn, of course, by the time the year's over, it won't look like this. And it'll have a, a lot of markings and underlines and notes that I'll put in the margin to her. Uh, and then next year, Lord willing, I'll move uh, on to another grandchild. Well, I hope you've joined me and taken the challenge to, to do the same thing, read God's word this year. Um, I promise it'll be in the end, one of the best things that you've ever done. You'll be blessed beyond your wildest dreams. I promise, I guarantee it. And it's not too late to start. Uh, we're just a week or so into 2021. And, and if you haven't started yet, you can catch up. Uh, or even better yet, don't worry about catching up. Just get started, get going, and finish a week or so into 2022. But I promise it won't be hard to catch up. You just do it a little bit at a time. But you're not far behind, and the blessings will be worth it. But don't get in a hurry reading. Uh, take your time. Let it soak in and let God's Holy Spirit speak to you and breathe life and truth into you from God's Word. 15, 20 minutes a day is all it'll take, and it'll change your life. Well, God has a ton of stuff to teach you and to tell you in his word, and you'll never be the same. And if you haven't picked up one of these uh, daily Bibles or ordered, you can get them at uh, Mardell's or any Christian bookstore, uh, probably even any store that carries Bibles, you can find these. And you can also order them on Amazon. And... If you haven't done that or you're having trouble getting one, let me know and I'll get you one. I still have a few left uh, up there on the mantle that I'd be happy to send your way. And for a while at least, I, I plan to try each week to uh, share with you a snippet or two of what I came across in my reading of God's Word uh, the past week. So if you are reading God's Word as I will be and you're pretty much caught up, You'll, you'll have read uh, the same things that I've read. So I want to share one of those today. Here's what I came across this week, and I always look forward to, to reading this each year. Uh, it's the account of Enoch, uh, found in chapter 5 of Genesis. And you may have heard me refer to our relationship with the Lord um, as being one of walking with the Lord. And the account of Enoch is one of the places where I get that from. In fact, I'm just going to use uh, the daily Bible I'm using this year with my granddaughter, and I'll share with you what I wrote in it to her in the margin. Um, and it came on day three, January the 3rd. And um, it starts there in chapter five uh, with a listing of the genealogy of Adam. Now that doesn't sound very interesting. Uh, sounds pretty boring, in fact. But it isn't, and it isn't very long. Uh, but just to keep my interest, so I will read every word, I play a game each year when I come to this chapter, and, and it certainly helps out over numbers. You, you get into some names and genealogies, and you can do the same thing. But what I do is I write in the margins the age of the people who are listed there and when they died, how old they were when they died. And that's kind of fun. Uh, some amazing uh, lengths of ages. For example, Adam lived 930 years and then he died. And uh, 
You know, people lived longer in, in those days before sin had fully ravaged our bodies with sickness and illness and cancer, or other maladies, uh, whatever you can think of. You remember when God created us, it was good and there was nothing wrong, but our sin brought on all these things that, you know, when God uh, had told Adam that if you sin against me, you, you will die, it means spiritual death, but also physically death too. It just, it took a while for that to happen. But uh, anyway, you can only play this game that I'm talking about of writing in the margin um, for a few chapters in Genesis because indeed the age of earthly life starts receding very rapidly actually from this point forward in the scriptures. Anyway, Adam lived 930 years and he died and his son Seth, he uh, lived uh, 912 years and he died. And, and then Enish, not Enoch, but Enish, uh, lived 905 years, and it says then he died. And his son Can Canaan lived 910 years, and he died, and so forth, and on and on. But we finally get to Enoch in verse 18, and we read something very different about Enoch in verse 21. And I'm going to read uh, this passage to you. I'm going to read, it's chapter 5, if I can get on the right day, I'm not on the right day. Um, of Genesis, and I'm going to read verses 21 to 24. And it says, Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, in other words, Methuselah's, Methuselah was his son, Enoch walked with God 300 years, and he had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Did you see it? Did you hear it? He didn't die. It says, quote, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. You know, all of the others listed before and after Enoch in this chapter their demise or end says, and he died, but not with Enoch. Enoch's walk with the Lord was so close and so intimate that God just took him home one day. Isn't that cool? Here's what I wrote in the margin uh, to my granddaughter Haven about that. I said, this story of Enoch is a great one. He was very close to God. They walked with each other. And it appears one day God just took Enoch home to heaven. He didn't experience physical death. And then I referred her to go to Hebrews over in the New Testament 11.5, because of course that wasn't included that day. And I, I told her to do it right now, because it just take her a minute to pull that up. And so uh, I'll do that. So we'll follow along. And I've got Hebrews 11. And you remember Hebrews 11. We've been in, a lot, in that a lot over the last year when we studied Gideon and we studied Samson, both of them are in the Hebrew, Hebrews Hall of Fame, the Faith Hall of Fame. And that's where we're going to find old Enoch here. I want to read verses five and six. This kind of puts the bow on the package about what we read there in Genesis five. And it says, by faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. So indeed, it clarifies he didn't die. And he could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. Remember, it says he walked with him. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. What a great set of verses there. So when you hear me use that phrase, as some of you have pointed out that I say that quite often, how's your walk with the Lord? You'll have a reference point now about what I mean, a close, deep, personal relationship with our Lord, a fellowship and longing to be one with the other. God longed to be with him and Enoch longed to be with God. You know, uh, I want to use that to cheer you up, to encourage you. And, and I couldn't help, sound like a Saturday Night Live skit here. I came up with a little, little chant. Uh, how about this for walking with the Lord? Hey, hey, what do you say? Let's walk with the Lord that way. You know, that is our goal, is to walk with the Lord just like that. I get so excited. I could take all of our time today just recounting what we read this past week.
it's amazing how much was there in just those days. And I want to chase one more rabbit um, before we move on uh, that you would have seen this week. And it's in the very next chapter, chapter six, after Enoch. Uh, and you've heard of this guy, Noah. You've heard of him, haven't you? And in fact, Mary and I and the family, as I told you last week, we went to Branson, Missouri and saw the last showing and that sight and sound of Noah. And that, it was awesome. It's great. But at the end of chapter five, I'll grab Haven's Bible back. Uh, we read of his birth in verse 28. It says, um, 28, where are you there? Lamech, that's his uh, dad, lived 182 years and had a son. And he called his name Noah, saying, now this is a little uh, insightful as to what Noah's life is going to be like. This one, referring to Noah, Noah, will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. Well, that's pretty insightful as we're talking about the work and building the ark and his work of following the Lord. But I want to move on down. Um, let's see if I don't get lost in my notes here. Um, at the end of chapter 5, we read of his birth, and it says, uh, by the way, that Lamech, his father, lived to be 777. And guess who his grandpa was? Methuselah. Uh, and you've heard of Methuselah. How, how many of you have heard, probably as a grandpa or great-grandpa, said, well, he's as old as Methuselah. Well, he, he, you know how old Methuselah was when he died? It says right here in what we would have read uh, that he lived to the ripe old age of 969 years, the longest recorded age of man in Scripture. Anyway, the story of Noah and the ark really gets going in chapter 6 that you would have read this week. It continues through chapter 9 where he died at the ripe old age of 950 years. But uh, down in verse 5 in chapter or in, of, of 6, we pick up with several things I want to uh, bring to your attention and to point out to you. So I'm going to read verses 5 through 9 in chapter 6. This would have been on day 3 of your reading. Let's see. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was ju a just man, perfect in his generation. Noah walked with God. Did you catch that? Noah walked with God, just like Enoch did. And uh, he walked by faith. And so Noah was an obedient man. He followed God. And God gave him uh, credit for that, what I call Hall of Fame status credit uh, over in verse 7 of Hebrews that we just were at right after the deal about uh, Enoch. It says this in verse 7, chapter 11 of Hebrews, By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, he's referring to the fact that it never rained on earth at that time. They hadn't seen rain. In holy fear or reverence, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Now, don't think that this didn't all happen as God's word said it did, uh, that there was a world flood. You'll find some people say, yeah, I believe in a regional flood, but I don't believe that stuff in a worldwide flood. Folks, at the end of this year, when you've read God's word, you'll believe every jot and tittle. Uh, I promise you, uh, it, it will be a great thing. But let me just ask you to consider this for those of you who might want to gnaw on that and argue a little bit. Do you know that there are giant seafaring fish fossils in the plains of Kansas, just north of us? How'd that happen if there wasn't a flood? Did you know that there are fossils of fish found on the highest mountaintops all around the world? <laughs> How'd that happen? Jesus even validated that this was a true account of Noah and the flood in the New Testament. And we're not going to take the time, but I'll give you the reference. 
Go to Matthew 24, verses 37 to 39. If Jesus said it, you better believe it. Well, those are a few snippets from just this past week um, of God's Word. I think I maybe skipped the page, but it maybe went a little fast. Yeah, I did, because I wanted to point out just a couple more things uh, from those scriptures we read. Uh, the first one is it referenced the wickedness of man. Do you hear that? And that it grieved God. Those are in verses 5 and 6. And we, again, we won't take the time, but um, Jeremiah 17, 9, you could go there, and it tells us that the heart of man is deceitfully wicked uh, above all things and beyond cure. You know, I've had people want to argue, well, man is basically good. Well, that isn't what Scripture says. We're not good without God. If man's nature and his heart were good, would we need a Savior? Arguably, no. Uh, another thing I wanted to point out to you, Noah found grace in the eyes of our Lord. So people might emphasize, well, he destroyed man. He was upset that he created him and he just destroyed the whole world by the flood. Yeah, but because Noah was faithful to him, he found grace for him, saved the world in a sense through Noah and his uh, three children and their wives and his wife. But see it in verse 9, Noah, it says, walked with God just like Enoch did. And while God didn't walk Noah home to heaven uh, like he did Enoch, he, he did put Noah and his family in the ark and save them. You know, God had some work for Noah to do before he could go home uh, to heaven to be with the Lord. Like 50 to 100 years in building the ark, there's a lot of debate about how long that took, and we could spend time going over that. It's it's a fun thing to study, but he also had 350 years after the after he came out of the ark to basically reboot the human race. God used him and his sons and his family to restart the human race. And then uh, one other point I'll point out: verse 22 tells us that Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. We don't want to overlook that. Noah was obedient. He was a man of faith. No one had even seen rain or a thunderstorm. And uh, yet he built something that they didn't even know what it was. Of course, God gave him the instructions. But uh, God gave him uh, Noah Hall of Fame credit in verse 7. And uh, we looked at that and I read that to you just a minute ago. So those are some good things. Well, as I said earlier, just a few snippets from this past week in, of reading God's Word. Fun stuff, rewarding stuff, uh, life-giving stuff, God-growing stuff. Uh, join me. Uh, and, and if you have, stay on the journey. The sights we'll see this coming year are amazing and awesome. Well, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll cover a few more things. Lord God, uh, we again pause to praise you, to thank you for your precious word to us, the Holy Bible, written by men through inspiration of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for it. Forgive us for taking it for granted, for not really even understanding what it says and knowing what it says. Many men have died for your word, and a myriad of men have, have of course, tried to destroy it. Certainly Satan has, but you, Almighty God, have preserved it for us down through the millennia. Uh, every word of it and, and every jot and tittle is true. And we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord. Uh, give us a burning desire to read and to know and to understand your word. In our Savior's name, our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, <laughs> hate to turn the table on you, but um, after that fun little ride, uh, I have to bring it up, but I must. This has been a, another rough week uh, for the good old U.S. of A., hasn't it? You know, many of us just finished holiday season and watched uh, one of my favorite movies. Is it's a Wonderful Life, and there was a line in there um, when uh, Jimmy Stewart, uh, Mr. George Bailey, or uh, he says, uh, another red letter day for the old Bailey, Bailey, and uh, Bailey's uh, building and loan. And so I kind of borrowed that. Another good old week for the U.S. of A. Well, I won't go into all of what has happened. It, it, it certainly has been uh, historical. Uh, and the reason I'm go not going to is because I'm sure you've debated and fretted and discussed that plenty with your friends and relatives and work associates and so forth. 
But like so much that we've seen and we've heard and we've dealt with this past year, it's hard to find the truth. Uh, it, it, you can't figure out who's telling the truth uh, and who isn't. And my vote is probably uh, <laughs> no one is. You know, the only truth that we can put our feet on and rely on is God's word. Uh, God's word is truth. It's never changed, never will. God has never changed, he never will. But something came my way this week that uh, really struck me and uh, hit me about, um, and it hit home. Where do we go from here? Uh, you know, for, for some, what we're going through is depressing to consider. For some, it's, it's uh, scary to contemplate. Um, and for some, it's just surreal. Just can't believe all this is happening. And what about our children, our grandchildren? I hear people saying, I've said it. Uh, many my age and a little younger are asking that very question and worrying about, what about our children and grandchildren? Uh, because we know things are changing and, and happening so fast, it's happening right in front of our eyes and quickly. Especially now that one party holds not only the presidency, but the House and the Senate. And um, it appears that the skids are greased for a quick and radical change. They're going to look at that as a mandate for change. And what are you going to get with that? And I don't want to get into a political debate, but I don't think we can really argue these things. Uh, we seem headed for a more uh, socialistic society and government. Uh, it, I, it seems that we're going to have a culture that is going to be more dependent upon the government, certainly not upon God. And uh, we've become a people uh, who believe morality is decided by popular opinion or at the voting booth, certainly not from God's word. Um, as Dave Ramsey, uh, many of you have heard of him recently put it, I'm going to borrow this. He says, nothing makes sense anymore. No values, no morals, no civility. We are clearly living in an upside down world where right is wrong, where moral, moral is, what is moral is immoral and immoral is moral, where good is evil and evil is good, where killing murderers is wrong, referring to the death penalty, but killing innocent babies is right, end quote. Well, I agree with Dave Ramsey uh, to a great extent. Well, actually, everything he, that I just read to you. And, and I've been saying much the same thing for uh, quite a while now. And how I've been describing it is this way, and the people in my office are probably tired of hearing it, but the, I'll say something like, the plane is flying upside down. And... Um, God's word also speaks of this. And uh, that's where Dave Ramsey and I draw our opinions uh, from God's word. And there are many others. Uh, you can listen to preacher after preacher talk about it. But, and I'm not a preacher. I, uh, but, uh, and I'm not going to take the time today, but read sometimes, re when you get a chance, read Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. It's very sobering. Read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, or read 2 Timothy. <laughs> this one will really uh, kick the extra point to what we're talking about. 2 Timothy chapter 3. <laughs> wow. Well, <clears throat> I also want to share with you uh, something that was shared with me this week, and I suspect many of you may have seen it yourselves, the same thing. It's worth, it's encouragement, bears repeating. And... Um, it's like an antiseptic, if you will, uh, like an antibiotic. It, it's an ointment or a balm to an open wound. It, it's soothing. It's encouraging and reassuring in, in this upside-down, topsy-turvy COVID world that we're living in. And most importantly, what I'm getting ready to share with you, it's biblically sound and it's biblically based. It was posted by a young pastor, a youth pastor from Arkansas named Alex Cravens. Um, and I did a little research on him. Uh, he's a father of at least two young boys, I believe. And I want you to take a listen uh, to some thoughts that he put together while he was rocking his sleeping baby and thinking about this craziness that we've all experienced recently. He writes, quote, don't feel sorry for or fear for your kids because the world that they're living in or the world they're going to grow up in is not what it used to be. Now, I admit that got my attention when he said that. He goes on to write, 
God created them, referring to these children, and called them for the exact moment in time that they're in. Their life wasn't a coincidence or an accident. He implores us, raise them up to know the power they walk in. I love that, certainly, as children of God. Train them up in the authority of his word. God's word. Boy, he really got some brownie points with me on that one, didn't he? Hey, and I'll amen that. He says, teach them to walk in faith, knowing that God is in control. And you won't know that unless you read God's word. I promise you that. Empower them to know they can change the world. Don't teach them to be fearful and disheartened by the state of the world, but hopeful that they can do something about it. Of course, that's through being a believer and serving the Lord. He says, every person in all of history has been placed in the time that they were in because of God's sovereign plan. He knew Daniel could handle the lion's den. He knew David could handle Goliath. He knew Esther could handle Haman. He knew Peter could handle persecution. He knows that your child or my grandchildren can handle whatever challenges they face in their lives. He created them specifically for it. Don't be scared for your children, but be honored that God chose you to parent and grandparent the generation that is facing the biggest challenges of our lifetime. Rise up to the challenge. Raise Daniel's, David's, Esther's, and Peter's. God isn't scratching his head wondering what he's going to do with this mess of the world. He has an army he's raising up to drive back the darkness and to make him known all over the earth. Don't let your fear steal the greatness God placed on them, referring to the children. I know it's hard to imagine them as anything besides our sweet little babies, and we just want to protect them from anything that could ever be hard on them. But they were born for such a time as this. Oh, wow, isn't that amazing? What insight this young man, Alex Cravens, has and such wisdom that God uh, has given him. I feel better already just knowing that uh, there are young men and women out there, even though they may be uh, few in number, but who are God-fearing and are raising children for God. Doesn't that make you feel better? Well, we're about out of time. Uh, next week, I'll share uh, not only a few more snippets from our reading in God's Word for what we'll be reading this next week, but I'll also give you some highlights from the Truth Project that the Truth Seekers is going through uh, for the next couple of months. This is what we'll be watching, a video each week. And uh, I'm going to give some highlights from the Truth Project that we're going through. So next week I'll, I'll bone up on that a little bit and share some of that with you because probably some of the uh, members of that group will be watching as we really don't have time to do much discussion in class because it lasts 50 some minutes and there's just not enough time. But so we'll be handling some of that in these uh, upcoming videos. But you can be watching that too if you're not able to join us. I believe you can watch it on YouTube and certainly you can order as I did um, this to have your own set. But until then, I want you to be safe. Be in God. Walk like Noah and Enoch. And like these young children that this man implores us, Alex Cravens, to walk with our Lord Jesus Christ and be in the Word. May God bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace, brother and sister. Until next week, good day.